When you think of the word courage, what comes to mind? Just shout out your answers. If you're online worshiping with us today, type it in the comment section. I'll see if I can pick it up there. For most of us, courage conjures up a valorous ideal, you know, climbing Mount Everest or skydiving or David facing Goliath. We think of we think of courage in terms of what's demanded of us when we face something extreme, something out of the ordinary. But courage can also be needed when holding our child for the first time, or riding a bike without the training wheels, or leaving the house after quarantine. Courage could be admitting we need help, telling a partner how we really feel, or listening to someone tell us their truth. None of these examples are as glorious as our Hollywood ideals would per portray, but they are courageous moments in the extreme. What kind of a world would it be if those everyday acts were seen as more courageous? I think the psalmist is courageous in how they sing thanksgiving to God. We might just want to pause here this morning and take notes. The description of God is absolutely extreme, boundless, deep, and, and illimitable. God is exalted above everything, so that even when the kings of the earth shall praise you, God, for great is the glory of God, God seems too marvelous and too far beyond humanity ever to be bothered by what's happening with this speck of dust on the third rock from the sun. And yet the psalmist sings, for, for though God is high, God regards the lowly. God listens to the psalmist's prayers and worship. On the day I called you, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. God stretches out a divine hand with healing and grace when the psalmist feels hemmed in by whatever haunts them. And this God above and beyond everything in the, in the extreme has a purpose for me to be fulfilled. And not only that, this God above and beyond everything we can conceive is the one who will see it through. This God is almost beyond reach and always as close as our next breath. We need courage to swim in these divine waters. We need courage to ponder what we think and believe about this living God with us. Rene Brown, a renowned researcher, storyteller, and professor, reminds us that courage comes from a Latin root word meaning of the heart. The original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. Have you ever told anyone the story of who you are with your whole heart? Have you ever told God that story? <laughs> I wonder. The beginning of this Psalm utters absolute thanksgiving with extreme courage. I give you thanks, O God, with my whole heart. Every verse speaks of vulner vulnerability which is not winning or losing. The categories we hold beloved in our culture and society. Vulnerability is having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It's our greatest measure of courage, according to Brene Brown in Rising Strong. The psalmist tells their whole story to God with their whole heart. All the trouble, toil, and snares are spilled in between the syllables, even as they acknowledge they can't control the outcome. Will God accept them for who they really are? Do not forsake the work of your hands, sings the psalmist. The psalmist shows up and is seen. And when they have no control over what happens, 
and comes with a mouthful of praise and thanksgiving to God that this is the kind of relationship they share, a relationship unlike any other. There is no doubt. In verse after verse after verse, the psalmist reminds us that this God who is above and beyond all is right in the middle of us, all of us, and loving us all the way. Thanks be to God indeed. When I think of how powerful telling the story of who you are with your whole heart really is, how it can totally change the storyteller and all those who have ears to listen, I think of the story of Mike as told by the Reverend Matt Fillier. Unlike most teens who showed up to church camp on registration day, begrudging their tag along parents, Mike showed up with his social worker. Tall for his age, head shaved, muscular, with an eye that said, I dare you. I knew Mike would be a challenge. I wasn't wrong. He was prone to confrontation at the least provocation. His common retort to anyone who questioned his decision was, you want to fight? And fight he did for much of the week. But the camp staff decided they were not going to give up on Mike. This is who he was. And, and, and there was no more, there was no more, or there was more to him than his jagged exterior that had been shaped by multiple foster homes and by living on the bleeding edge of the society's privilege. Each time Mike's interactions would descend into conflict, the staff would take him aside and talk him down. If it took 10 minutes or an hour, it mattered not. Each time we would ask Mike if he would pray, if we could pray with him. Sometimes he would join in, but mostly he would be content for the church people to do the church thing. After a few days, Mike got the message. He had nowhere to run. We weren't going to run away and we weren't going to fight. We did something all the more insidious. We would love him and walk with him throughout his time with us. As the week unfolded, he made friends. The rest of the camp could see the effort he was putting in and reached out to model the same courage the staff were demonstrating. It worked. Mike's hard exterior of resentment softened, and he led, uh, led us into his world. It was a privilege. It was church at its finest on the last day of camp. Everyone was in the dining hall, busily gobbling up the kitchen's last supper, a full turkey dinner with all the trimmings. In all the clutter and chaos of mealtime at camp with 80 kids, Mike slid back his chair and walked to the front of the room. He found the neatest soapbox any street corner preacher could desire, a milk crate, and proudly stood on it. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> the room was silent, and Mike proceeded to testify. He said, before we leave, I just want to tell you all, let all of you know that I love you. I love you because you loved me. I don't belong most places, but here I found my place. I will never forget you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, after the tsunami of, of tears, an eruption of applause followed. Mike is still in my heart to this day. I'm still telling this story. I still pray. He has found his place in the world. Mike told the story of who he was with his whole heart. He had no control over the outcome. He was absolutely courageous because he was willing to trust and be vulnerable with us. That is the gift of church. It changed his life and it's still changing mine. I can never repay Mike in kind for the honor he extended to me and to us. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, 
You preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. God will fulfill God's purpose for me. Your steadfast love, God, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. From Psalm 138, verse 3 and 7 to 8. I can never thank God enough for the power of community filled with the transformative power of the Spirit. That's church. After all, church is the place where we can show up and tell our whole story and know here we are gifted, called, and chosen. We are God's people. We are not alone, and nothing and no one can take that away. The congregation at St. John's in Marathon, Ontario, defines their core ministry as radical and intentional hospitality. It is a small church and no longer can do all of the things they used to do. Now they measure everything they do through that core ministry. So it happens that one of the church families assisted three strangers they met at the local thrift store one stormy day. The travelers had spent the night in their car because the highway was closed because of a severe winter storm. The message given to the travelers was to call this phone number and tell my husband to put extra potatoes in the pot because your wife has invited us to dinner. The call was made. The strangers were invited to arrive whenever they were ready. Shortly before the set meal hour, three strangers arrived at their host's home. They were welcomed, fed, and invited to stay the night because the road still had not yet opened. During the evening conversation following the meal, the couple were asked by their guests why they invited three strangers into their home. And the host couple responded that as members of their United Church, they were called to live out their core ministry of hospitality where one is without shelter, provide lodging. If one is hungry, provide food. For those who are naked, provide clothing. The next morning, the travelers continued their journey west after another good breakfast meal and more food for the way. This is but what a many times this story and others like it have unfolded in this faith community. They still hear from the street, three strangers from time to time who still give thanks for the hospitality and prayers for safe travel and food for the way. How do you respond to that kind of extreme grace and acceptance? What are we to do with this almost beyond us, always with us, God? Simple. I give you thanks, God. With my whole heart, I sing your praise. I give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Your steadfast love endures forever. Friends, thank you. Thank you for being my church. Thank you for being our church. Thank you for giving from the abundance of your treasure. For there, your whole heart will also be. When we give with our whole heart, when in our giving we tell the whole story of who we are as God's people, lives can be changed. The world can be turned. And, and what seems like a dead end is transformed into the beginning of something altogether new. Friends, the spirit in me honors the spirit in you. Thanks be to God. Amen.